Hello. I wanted to talk a bit about scratch building. Not so much a how-to sort of thing, but rather sort of an inspirational kind of thing. Just hoping to encourage folks who haven't tried it yet to give it a go. But first off, I must confess, I come from a family that tends to do things the hard way. I had an uncle who described my grandfather as being such by telling me that he believed Grandpa and Grandma probably knocked him out while standing up in a hammock. So, given my family DNA, I may not be the best instructor when it comes to knocking out a scratch build. But, there are many super great modelers out there who have generously given up some of their time to post really good how-to videos. One modeler I follow a lot is Boomer on his Boomer Diorama slash River Railroad. Check him out as well as the many others for some great instruction on this. They are really great modelers. And I'm quite sure that none of them are standing up in a hammock. Quite simply, we usually take the scratch building because there is nothing available to us otherwise. So we're forced to do it ourselves if we want that particularly neat piece on our layout. That desire to include that perfect scene fitting piece provides us with the gumption to attempt the endeavor. So, my first bit of advice is never let go of that desire. But the most important thing I want to stress is just give it a go. Try it. Let that desire push you along. After all, some bills can be pretty easy. Perfect to get started on. This is a shot of my very first scratch attempt done about 50 years ago now. It is a simple wood structure that sat on my old layout. Much simpler back then. It certainly didn't look like this when I first built it. It's since been repainted and refitted with new doors and windows and a skylight piece, along with water tanks and other things over its lifetime, all resulting from my getting better at some skills. But that's my point here. If your first attempts don't come out just right, or as well as you might have wished, let that desire push you to keep trying again. Just try it again. And I can most assuredly tell you that every modeler that's ever done this will say the same thing. You get better and better as you go along. We all have made big mistakes and totally wrecked things along the way. But that is exactly how we improved our skills. One mistake after yet another, proving that experience is indeed the best teacher. And I would add, the more experience, the better the outcomes. So I can only encourage you to get started now, making those first million mistakes while getting frustrated with it all. You'll love it. It's the best fun. Nobody starts out being really good, but getting better is really cool, trust me. As for the time needed for all this, I can imagine what some may be thinking. I don't have time for all of this. I hear you. But that's the beauty of it. You do this all at your own pace. Let me remind you of the obvious. It's a hobby. No one's life is at stake here. It gets done at the pace that you choose. Think of it as a lifetime time lapse, one that you create at your pace. And if your DNA is anything like mine, you will learn to develop some great patience. Building some trestle work I knew was going to be a challenge for me and my patience. So, necessity being the mother of invention, I quickly learned to cheat a bit in my need to build trestle vents. Ergo, a jig I made for aligning piles and cutting and gluing them all together. I used wood dowels for the piles and scale wood for the cross pieces. And boy, the chopper sure helped. And while styrene is my modeling material of choice, I have used it as well in building styrene forms to pour plaster of Paris bridge and trestle piers. Speaking of using wood as a building material, my lack of patience, as well as trying to overcome my do-it-the-hard-way thing, 
I decided the simple piece of 1x4 could serve as my car float barge. Believe me, it was much easier building it than its steering house. Is it perfect? Heavens no. But it works for me, which is another point I'd make. There's always going to be the chance that someone might criticize your work, and that's fine. It happens. But it's your model, and if you like it, that's all that matters. Unless, of course, you're entering it into a contest, I suppose. But since I've only once entered anything into a contest, and came in second, out of only two entries submitted, I've decided contests aren't really part of my DNA anyway. After some experience putting together a bridge kit, I decided I could scratch out one of my own for my swing span at Petaluma. Later, as my Petaluma and Santa Rosa Railroad was coming together, I needed a bay schooner of theirs that would pass through this open channel on its way to the city across the bay. So, never having built a boat before, my desire pushed me into a new project. If it didn't work out, well, it'd be fun trying. Just a few bucks worth of styrene would be lost, right? Anyway, with my desire pushing me, I gave it a go. Now, since this build, I discovered that fellow modeler Boomer has taken on a tugboat build of his own. You gotta check it out. That guy is really something else. Now, I realize this ain't the easiest thing to try and take on, but, you know, again, you take it bit by bit, plan it out, step by step, break it down, and it's it really will come together for you. Give it a try. Another project that I'd always wanted to do, but figured I didn't have room for, was to build the old Seal Stadium here in town. Its Art Deco style was just too cool not to include on the layout. Of course, the entire thing wouldn't fit, but what about just the left field side of the stadium? It was going to be a challenge to fit it in. Some surgery on that part of the layout was definitely in order. Probably the biggest challenge was how to keep two active tracks below it from being blocked. But with some maneuvering here and there, moving and rebuilding a couple of adjacent buildings, including the iconic Ham's Brewery with its famous sign, I had successfully installed Seal Stadium with a track directly below home plate. And it sits upon Petrero Hill's outcropping of bluish-green serpentine, which I thought would be cool to model. And I actually included a real piece of the rock at the lower left, just for those critics who would insist that real rock cannot be that color. You see, I, I've got critics too. But once again... Driven by the desire to do so, another not-so-easy project worked out, even though it required some major reconstructive surgery. Probably my most challenging project was San Francisco's ferry building, but once again, it was a must-have for the layout. Now, I completed it many years ago when there was no other alternative but to build my own, but since that time, with the advent of 3D printing, there are indeed a couple of sources for some great printed models now. Where were they when I needed them, huh? And another absolute must-have for me would be Southern Pacific's 3rd and Townsend Station. Of course, once again, it's never been manufactured by anyone. So, my desire would lead the way, and off I went. Now, just what materials does one use for these projects? Well... I'm a styrene fanatic. I like it because it's very workable, but better yet, it goes together very well with the help of some good solvents that, and how can I say, kind of melt it together. Simply position the pieces you wish to join together, and with a brush, apply the solvent to where they join, and voila! Capillary action draws the solvent into the joint, and the two pieces weld themselves together providing for some very strong joints, and pretty quickly, I might add. And it's that last characteristic that I like so much, me having that little problem with patience. Now, while care needs to be taken on every joint made, you can move along rather quickly, not having to wait too long for the glue to dry. Now, while we're here, I'd make a couple of suggestions. 
Some of these solvents come with a brush installed in their bottle cap. There are a lot of instances where the amount of solvent that this brush can carry will too often be many times more than the particular joint will need, which is why I show the small brush that I use. It has virtually supplied solvent to almost every joint I've ever made. The other suggestion Put the bottle into something, whatever you want, to make sure it doesn't tip over. Again, I can safely speak for every modeler who's ever used it. Trust us, we've learned the hard way and usually destroyed what we're working on, not to mention everything else on the workbench. The other thing about styrene is that thanks to manufacturers like Evergreen and Plastruck, you can find it in almost any dimension as well as any shape. It comes in strips and sheets and shapes of varying dimensions and thicknesses. Virtual lumber yard for anything you need. Most frankly, if it weren't for styrene, I'd never have enough patience to equal any desire I might have to construct something. And I wouldn't be here to try and encourage you into scratch building. So, if it sounds like I'm a salesman for Evergreen or Plastruck, I will gladly plead guilty. A trip into the operating room, my workbench, reveals some of the tools and adhesives I've collected over the years. Certainly not everything I've got, but a sampling of things that get all of this styrene put together. So, with all of our goodies, let's get to it. I know, pretty intimidating. But, now I put this picture up to show just the various parts of the build. Taking it on bit by bit, you'll get there. Really, you can do this. A lot of planning is involved, for sure, but taking your time and breaking down each step of the way, the gigantic project becomes a series of easier, smaller projects. Believe me, if you grew up loving to play with Lincoln Logs or American Building Bricks, you'll really enjoy this stuff. Now, as your skills continue to improve, let your imaginations take things from there. Soon you'll be doing things you never thought of, and then you'll be doing even bigger things, and so on and so on. Next thing you know, you're building the Eiffel Tower, or in my case, the Third Street Bridge, or a pedestrian bridge over the tracks. And, it doesn't hurt to get outside of N-Scale a bit. It's a good idea to steal some HO parts once in a while. Or finally, you might get crazy enough to try building a steeple cab motor. Well, let's go back to the first structure I showed in the opening. This is the passenger station at Vancouver, Washington. Amtrak and the Cascades still use this today in passenger service. It was designed by Francis Swingle and built in 1908 for the Northern Pacific and its subsidiary, the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle. It sits inside the Y where tracks head off to the north to Seattle east toward Spokane, and south to Portland, crossing the Great Columbia River. But why would I want to build this? Well, it's a great question. Even though SBNS is a favorite of mine, and I do indeed have some models in that, my layout models San Francisco and areas to the north on what used to be the Northwestern Pacific. So there's no place for it on this layout, but I did have a couple of reasons to pursue this build. One is that Vancouver is my mom's hometown, and it's just kind of neat having something from there. And by the way, as many of you know, it's a killer place to watch trains. Another reason is that I'm intrigued by gable and hip roofs, and the roof on this station is unlike any I've seen. It is indeed somewhat unique as its gables seem to overlap themselves in a most delightful way. So it became a personal challenge for me to see if I might come close to replicating it. Okay, now the first challenge for such a scratch build is coming up with dimensions. Now nowadays, 
There are some neat computer programs, such as SketchUp, that can help. But when I started doing this, let's say a long time ago now, nothing like that existed. So, while this part of the project is, at least to me, the most challenging part, it is, in its own way, the most fun. But unless you can actually go out and take some actual measurements from a building, and that's if it even still exists, we're forced to work from pictures. And the more pictures, the better. Now, even with programs such as SketchUp, you will need to have at least one actual known dimension for the program to do its thing. Assuming we can't get actual measurements, we are forced to do what I call some comparative figuring. And to do this, it helps if you can get all the pictures or photos you can get your hands on, or research from books or the net. Now with these, you make comparisons between recognizable objects in those shots to the building that they are next to or part of. An example that most folks use is to figure the height of a business door or a person standing adjacent to the building. The door being seven, seven and a half foot tall and a person being five and a half or six foot tall. Now, while this is not exactly accurate, it gets you in the ballpark. And you can also use scale manufactured doors and windows to aid in your effort here. Now you then use these to ratio other dimensions, if you will, multiplying them into building dimensions. Looking for fixed angles such as that of a gable, I've actually used protractors taking a measurement directly off a photo, but this can be very tricky because you need to have good perpendicular alignment for that. Now, sketching out a measured plan will help you visualize your dream, but as you sketch it out, keep your comparisons going as you keep reviewing all of your pictures when you start to assign dimensions to your project. You'll probably find that all of these dimensions kind of cross-reference each other as you continue along. But remember, this particular exercise is just like any other. The more you work at it, your skill sets will continue to get better. Don't be discouraged to try. Don't be afraid to mess it up. It takes some work, but let that desire of yours keep pushing you to get it better. Sometimes, most usually, you'll need to adjust, I dare say readjust your plans, two, maybe dozens of times. But here's an example of where I changed my plan. It was an easy one because it was simply to delete part of the building. A few years after its original construction, the station building had a small addition added to its south side. And while I had planned to include that in the build, I decided against it because I thought it would hurt the overall look of the station. In real life, as it is indeed today, one doesn't notice it at all that much as it is orientated south toward the river, kind of on the lee side of the building. But one of the goals I had with this build was to capture the original balanced look of the station, with nothing interfering with the original form of this beautiful thing. So, it got redlined out of the build. I'm sure model purists will criticize this, but it's my station. Now, I knew this particular build was going to be a challenge for me, but it really wasn't quite so apparent until I actually got into it. While I knew getting the roof structure together would have to be planned out sequentially, even getting this thing painted had to be figured out, as once it was all together, I wouldn't be able to get parts of it painted or roofed. So, it added that much more drama for me as I went along. What fun! No, to be sure, I took a lot of breaks and a good deal of aspirin. But in the end, my desire to put this thing together pushed me along to its completion. And I like it. And I do think Mob would smile as well. <laughs>